I need you to be good. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'm watching you. I want to thank everybody at Karis, especially Elizabeth. We get like a little round of applause for Elizabeth. This has been a great professional and personal relationship with Karis, books and more. Uh, just a wonderful gem in our community, and I just I'm happy to be a part of you know, the community that's built here. And thanks to all of you for showing up. Thanks to my homegirl Robin, who is in the back, with yes. Sophie, who drove all the way from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, to help me celebrate. Uh, thanks to my boo thing, Lanise, who's in the back, who came from Michigan, to help me celebrate. Hey, everyone. Hey, hey girl. Hey, girl. Um, <laughs> Look at this so, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, girl. Thank you. And so uh, I want to start off by talking about like how this started. It was a dissertation project. When I was a doctoral student at Emory University in the early 2000s, from 2000 to 2007, 2002 to 2007. And so I worked on my dissertation, and I feel like I want to stand. I don't know, yes, is that wrong? Yeah. 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 It feels good, OK, because yeah. sitting is weird. Is that what it is? Yeah. I'm like, OK, so let's come on. Let's talk about it. That's kind of what I want to do. But um, oh, God. yeah, so I won't like assign anything. I won't make anybody take any notes for now. Uh, but uh, I was interested really in talking about motherhood and how motherhood could be sort of a transformative kind of space for black women. Not in a romantic kind of way, like, oh, we're earth mothers and here we are. But that how, you know, sort of thinking about how at least the black women I knew knew how to like turn, make a dollar out of 15 cents kind of thing, right? And then like sort of take trash and make it into treasure or whatever the cliche that I might think of. Um, but that, that was actual real and pragmatic and also how did black women in these circumstances create community. And so I wrote that dissertation and I was like, I think I'm done with this. But then I was continuing to be interested in family and community and that's how this topic sort of came about. Um, and I was particularly interested in you know, how respectability politics and family and community were connected together. I felt like that was something that was inseparable. Um, and I kept on coming back to it, even as I was trying to write a completely different project, which was like about language and semiotics, and I was trying to use like Bakhtin and be like super theoretical and oh, right. It just wasn't working. It wasn't the project that I needed to write. And eventually, after many twists and turns and a false start with another press that shall remain nameless, <laughs> but um, I worked it out with. Uh, the University of Virginia Press. So I know that this is a teeny tiny picture, but if you have a copy of my book or if there's a copy of the book that might float around, I can pass this around, this is the copy that I have. Um, there's um, a photo of my mom and my sister on the front. I'll just pass it around so you can see. And the, the reason why there's a photo of my mother on the front is sort of, can, completely tied to this notion of the paradox of respectability, which is one of the, the subtitle to the book, right? So at the final stage, just a few months ago, actually, this is probably in November, the publisher emailed me and was like, you know, we have a, a, a book cover for you. And I'm like, word, I told you, no, I want black women on the cover. I'm so excited. And I get this email, and it's a bunch of concentric circles oh. with, the, with the title of my book, right? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't see black women on this cover. So I think it's about family and community and respectability and all these things. They said, we're sorry. We'll go back to the drawing board. We'll try again. And then the next week, I get an email, and it's a picture of a bunch of hands on top of each other <laughs> with a watermark that says stock photo. <laughs> so I was feeling a type of way about it. Um, I had already sent this picture of my mom and my eldest sister, Marie, as a sort of guide. I didn't necessarily want the picture. Did everybody? Oh, you can think of it. Um, I didn't necessarily want that picture on the cover, but I said, you know, the reason why I showed this to you is because I really think it exemplifies what the book is about. So the picture is taken about 1969, 1970. It says 1970 on the back, but when I showed my mother the book, she said, 1970? Who told you that? Uh. You did. <laughs> so that's fine. So 1969, 1970, around there. Uh, it's taken in Jamaica at a studio in Kingston, Jamaica, where my mom is from. She's from Jamaica, and 
She was living in Kingston at the time. And my sister's about one and a half, two years old in it. My mother was a 34, 35 year old single parent. Um, this was her first child. She thought, oh, I can't have any children. And oh, then the child appeared, right? Uh, not married. She was uh, a domestic and sort of, you know, sort of struggling, right? But here she thought, I'm going to take a picture. I'm going to go down to a studio and spend the little money that I have and take this picture in my best outfit. I'm going to dress up my baby girl in her best outfit. I'm going to bring a doll. There's a little white doll. I don't know if you can see that. My sister is holding a white doll. She's dangling it. Uh, and the picture is just very formal, right? She's standing there. My sister's on this chair. And she's just, they're just posing for this picture. It's the one picture that my sister has. One baby picture. It's sort of the opposite in my family. You know how like the youngest usually has like one picture and the oldest has like all these pictures. But there was a, pri a, a, a class difference that my mother had in the 1960s and 70s where you couldn't just like go and have pictures taken. It was a big deal and technology was different. You could take a Polaroid in 1980 when I was born and you, they didn't really have that kind of same technology if you were a, a poor black woman living without electricity, you know, and running water in a, a city, you know, in the third world. So that picture is prominent in my mother's house. It's prominent in my sister's house. It's prominent for me. I have a copy of it, although I need to get it framed. And so, <laughs> oops, sorry, mama. Um, but the picture to me really exemplifies the sort of ways in which folks attempt to be respectable. But if you know the story, they quote, fall short. There's nothing about my mother that's not respectable, right? She's a lovely person. She raised three daughters. She's great. But in terms of the story, right, the story behind her life, three children, three baby daddies, grammar school education, whatever, whatever our stories are, they may not seem all that respectable behind the sort of the lens, right? Whatever secrets we have. And to me, that exemplifies that paradox of respectability. We try so hard to be respectable, but there's no way to actually be respectable, so it's a kind of Sisyphean task, right? You're always trying to sort of like roll that rock up the hill and it just rolls back down on you, right? So it's a strategy that has some aspects to it that might work, but it ultimately is self-defeating. So that's sort of what I came up with, and that's why that picture is there. It's that she's respectable, she's lovely, she's my mama, this is my family, this is my story, but how respectable are we? And what does respectability really mean? to us. So that picture got to be on the cover after I said, so what we're not going to do is have a bunch of hands <laughs> on the cover of a book that I worked for so long to get completed. And they said, how about we just put this picture of your mama on here? So my mother is beautiful and my sister is gorgeous and this little white baby doll is just there. And so <laughs> we're going to make it happen. So that's how that cover came to be and that's sort of what I'm interested in. Um, I want to read uh, a portion of the book that I think outlines um, what's at stake and some of the key terms um, in the book. And so I just want to read a couple of pages. If you were at my house party, you might have heard some of this. Sorry, I'm going to repeat. Uh, I hope that's still interesting and not boring. But uh, there's some key terms like what is respectability, what is respectability politics, or what's this paradox? I can sort of get into that more. But I start off the book by sort of framing the discussion, both in the United States and the Caribbean. I'm interested in a comparative analysis as someone of Caribbean descent who was born in the Caribbean, who was raised in Caribbean communities in the United States. I see a lot of points of convergence, even though I see distinct differences, right? I mean, the communities are not collapsible. There are lots of ways in which we're quite different. But in terms of talking about respectability in the West, I think that there are ways in which a, a comparison is really productive and fruitful. So I just want to read a, a couple of pages and talk about um, how I got started. So tensions around marriage and family provide perhaps some of the most compelling examples of the ambivalence around respectability politics for many blacks in the United States and the Caribbean. Take, for instance, the issue of marriage. In a recent article entitled, When Having Babies Beats Marriage, Harvard Magazine writer, ooh, sorry, that's my phone bill. Okay, professor. Ooh, bad professor. <laughs> Probably my mama. Uh, Harvard Magazine writer Kevin Hartnett uh, provides persuasive evidence that, quote, the decoupling of marriage from childbearing among lower income Americans is arguably the most profound social trend in American life today and has sparked intense political debate. 
While when having babies beats marriage is focused generally on low income uh, families of all stripes, it's important to note that more often than not, the term low income family and its attendant characteristics, female headed, poverty stricken, undereducated, have been code for the misperceptions of black families generally in the public imaginary. So they're talking about lots of people, but I read the code. Given the significance of marriage and family in public discourse during the last decades of the 20th century, Harnett's claim is certainly not without merit. He outlines the trends concerning marriage, noting that, quote, in 1960, it didn't matter if you were rich or poor, college educated or high school dropout, almost all of American women waited until they were married to have kids. Now 57% of women with high school degrees or less education are unmarried when they bear their first child. However, citing the research of public policy scholar Catherine Eden, Harnett also suggests that, quote, even as low-income Americans view marriage as out of reach, they continue to see bearing and raising children as the most meaningful activity in their lives, end quote. That is, come with me in the apartment. That is, even though that, you know how to call you out. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> that is, even without legal marriage, the low-income Americans featured in the, the article routinely form strong attachments to one another through child rearing. So marriage is something that's like, hmm, I can take it or leave it. Children, that's important. That yokes people together. Similar ideological shifts are also occurring throughout the Caribbean. In nat nations such as Barbados, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago, okay, clearly a lot is happening here. <laughs> Facebook messages. Um, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm popular. Yeah, but, um, so in these nations, cohabitation and out of wedlock births among the working class of African descent are not uncommon. What is changing, however, is the reaction to such circumstances when they occur among the middle classes. Scholar of Caribbean Family <coughs> Studies Raymond T. Smith asserts that, quote, fortunately, and not a little ironically, mainstream family practice is beginning to approximate, in some respects at least, the previously despised pattern of poor blacks so that the pejorative expressions such as born out of wedlock are losing their capacity to injure, end quote. Uh, so he also uncouples deviance from family practices that do not affirm, quote, traditional ideals of respectable family life, Noting that, quote, unstable marriage, separate residence of spouses, or even the complete whittling way of the marriage relationship completely <coughs> is not necessarily a sign of social instability or of pathological development. So this is happening in both the Caribbean and the United States. It's great. It's progressive, seemingly. But I would argue that even while people are, fewer people are necessarily pursuing legal marriage, although we could talk about sort of gay marriage in the United States and, and what that might mean. Uh, the notion that marriage is an ideal worth pursuing and an example of highly respectable behavior has not gone out of fashion. And that circumstance, that sort of tension, has at times uh, yielded problematic results. So that's sort of where I think my intervention comes in, right? Uh, so respectability politics, this notion that marriage and sort of traditional family, and I'm using traditional to mean sort of nuclear family, and I want to put traditional in quotes because the nuclear family is actually not all that traditional. It's a fairly recent invention. People have been living in sort of extended family um, units and so on for centuries, and this nuclear family is like the new kid on the block that all of a sudden has become the thing that we've done forever, right? Um, so... These conversations around respectability politics and marriage are happening in lots of different places, but I'm particularly looking at literature because I'm an English professor and that's what I like to do. Um, and so the thing that I think is interesting going back to the picture that I mentioned is this notion that things like the ideal of marriage, they are held up as ideals, but marriage as we know or any kind of long-term commitment is difficult. It's difficult to, to sustain. So if that's the thing that's going to make you respectable, but you can't have a long-term relationship because your baby daddy, your baby mama, a home girl, or whoever is not quite right, and you can't make it work, but that's the one thing that can make you respectable, not, not how you treat people, not your community work, not that you bake cookies out to the church, none of that. It's being married and having children in wedlock is your main thing, but that doesn't work, then what are you left with? You're left with ambivalent family connections, right? So... Um, 
I argue that writers such as Alice Walker, Michelle Cliff, Toni Morrison, the folks that I profile in my book, like Paul Marshall, Sapphire, who I'll talk about in a little bit, that they um, argue that what happens is ambivalence comes into play in the novels that they write, that they show characters feeling ambivalence towards their family relationships because respectability politics are so hard to adhere to, right? And so these ambivalent familial connect connections are not marked by hesitancy or indecision, but by a set of seeming contradictions. So on the one hand, a strong sense of duty to their families and simultaneously an active harboring of resentment towards that duty, right? And that's sort of the paradox. Like, I want to do this, I fucking hate this, right? And so how do you sort of make this work? At the same time, these are not just books that are um, necessarily just showcasing problems, but I think that they are pieces of art that also are engaging in sort of political and social justice work. And so they also forward this notion that I'm calling um, an ethic of uh, community support and accountability, which builds upon Patricia Hill Collins' notion of an ethic of uh, support and accountability. So uh, this ethic is rooted in sort of all the things that respectability politics are not rooted in, right? Um, but it's not a political strategy in the same sort of way, and I can talk about that a little bit more. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, I already talked about how the, the sort of regions matter. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some examples that might be familiar to you guys in terms of like a lot of people have read The Color Purple, right? Right. So. Alice Walker in The Color Purple, when she's talking about ambivalence, she uses it to foreground destructive family practices in The Color Purple, right? So Harpo and Sophia, our favorite couple, their relationship, I would argue, is sort of functional in the beginning, in the very beginning, like when they're courting, right? And perhaps even somewhat egalitarian with the couple eschewing normative divisions of domestic labor, right? So for example, in a gendered role reversal that rejects the norms of their community, you see Sophia fixing the roof and Harpo is washing the dishes. Like that, he likes to tidy the kitchen, that's his thing. And she's like, I'm handy and I'm outside, right? It's not until Harpo becomes overly concerned with his status as a respectable man in his community, wanting Sophia to mind, that ambivalence comes into play in Walker's depiction of their relationship, and subsequently, their family is divided. So it's not black folk not being respectable, it's actually the attempt to be respectable that causes the downfall. That's what I like. Um, so thus, uh, Walker highlights the destructiveness of respectability politics for, in Seeley's words, if Harpo, quote, hadn't tried to rule over Sophia, the white folks never would have caught her. Mm -hmm. right? So then Walker aligns Harpo's desire for control with the violence of white supremacy. So in that way, I see that as a pattern happening throughout bl black women's literature from the United States and the Caribbean, saying actually, I mean, this is an argument that we've been saying for a while, that respectability politics actually reinforces white supremacy, hegemony, patriarchy, and so on, right? But I think sort of flipping that script and saying it's not, it's never the fault, or very rarely the fault of black people, right? It's that this paradigm and this strategy is faulty at, at its very core, right? That Yes, we want to have um, political access and we want to be in the pub public sphere as citizens, right? That's the whole goal of respectability politics. But if it's going to fracture yourself and your family in order so you can get the vote or, you know, whatever it is that Don Lemon is telling us this week, <laughs> we can pull up our hands, um, it's actually not worth it, right? So I want to also give an example from the book Push. How many people have read Push, maybe? Or seen the movie Precious? OK, so pretty much everybody knows what I'm talking about. I didn't want to read from something that was necessarily um, uh, totally new, right? But I have chapters on uh, Paul Marshall's Pray Song for the Widow, Jamaica Kincaid's Annie John, uh, Edwige Dantica's um, Breath Eyes Memories, and Sapphire's Push. So I take a look at different aspects of respectability politics, um, ambivalence and also this ethic of community support and accountability that's really important to me. So my last chapter is called The Language of Family because PUSH is so much about language, right? It's about language acquisition, 
but I think it's also about like how does Precious come to voice and how does she talk about how does she literally talk about family so I just want to sort of read the intro and then talk a little bit about um, what an ethical community support and accountability looks like because I think we spend a lot of time thinking about respectability politics but one thing that made this project sustainable after working on it for so many years was thinking about the ways in which these books really gave me I felt like um, uh, a, a guide book or a road map, right? It's like, I'm here for the art. I'm an English professor, so I'm, I'm here for art for art's sake to a certain degree. But I felt like I'm also reading these texts and they're beautiful and they're saying, actually, this is how you can treat other people. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm reading for multiple reasons, right? So I'm arguing that Sapphire's push is actually talking back to narratives of back black pathology, even though it's a text that's very controversial and has been argued that it's actually reinforcing mm -hmm. black pathology because of its portrayal of incest mm -hmm. and drug abuse and violence and HIV and so on. So, on August 22, 1996, President Bill Clinton signed the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996, <coughs> more commonly known as welfare reform. The Clinton administration described the legislation as a, quote, comprehensive bipartisan welfare reform reform plan uh, that will dramatically change the nation's welfare system into one that requires work in exchange for time-limited assistance. The law contains strong work requirements, a performance bonus to reward states for moving welfare recipients into jobs, state maintenance of, efforts, of effort requirements, comprehensive <coughs> child support enforcement, and supports for families moving from welfare to work, including increased funding for child care and guaranteed medical coverage. That's the actual language from the bill. Strict work requirements are the foundation of this legislation. Heads of households must find employment within two years of receiving assistance, and within months of receiving initial benefits, they must work in a community service program that is volunteer until they find employment. Additionally, families who get benefits have a maximum five-year cumulative limit on receiving welfare funds. <coughs> While the reform has been relatively successful in getting people off welfare, it has been less successful in helping former recipients become self-sufficient because it largely removed a safety net for millions of the poorest Americans and moved other struggling families into a service economy that does not come close to providing a living wage. One of the most striking aspects of welfare, welfare reform is its impetus, however. Certainly, reforming welfare is an agenda item for almost every presidential administration. Nonetheless, this 1996 legislation emerged during the height of the so-called culture wars, which is also when this book, uh, when push comes out. Uh, when the uh, struggle between the political right and left over the direction of the country was part of a sensationalized national drama, and certainly culture wars are still continuing. Right? Mm -hmm. Frequently poor and working class Americans, especially people of color, were pawns in this national game, representing some of the most loathed aspects of American society. The abject, unassimilated masses who, rather than pulling themselves up by their proverbial bootstraps, became welfare queens and sucked the lifeblood from the nation, reproducing incessantly without adding anything to society except for increasing financial burdens. Thus, the welfare reform that emerged from this period was based less on solid data than on the notion that welfare recipients from this period, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, had little in incentive to work. That is, they had a skewed sense of personal responsibility and that they therefore needed governmental intervention to help them become responsible, respectable citizens. The very title of the bill, mm -hmm. the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act reveals this ideology. Thus, while the legislation was ostensibly billed as a hand up rather than a hand out, it was guided as much by deeply ingrained notions about misplaced entitlements as by a desire to better the lives of the nation's poor. Mm -hmm. I'm being generous. <laughs> <laughs> In 1996, the same year Clinton's welfare reform passed, New York-based poet-turned-novelist Sapphire published her controversial and provocative novel, Push, an indictment of the ideology around the black poor that emerges out of the culture wars era. Uh, and I sort of argue that Push might seem a little different than the other novels that I read, that I talk about in the book, which seem like sort of straightforward triumphs and so on. You know, Precious has a very particular story. It's very hard, right? And so there's a sequel, and it doesn't, Precious's life don't turn out all that well, and her son's life doesn't turn out all that well. So 
Um, whereas the other novels are, I think, maybe more traditional black feminist texts coming out of the 70s and 80s, right? But I argue that push belongs in this discussion, right? Okay, so I think that, for one, uh, it emphasizes the growing importance of educational communities and black women's empowerment, that it talks about ambivalence and respectability in ways that are really interesting and important to know, right? Uh, and also talks about diaspora in ways that are interesting. But for our time here, I just wanna emphasize the following. That push indicts the effects of the culture wars of the 1980s and 90s by exposing the paradox of respectability in which some blacks which wish to conform to the ideals of respectability politics, but at the same time find it difficult, if not impossible, to live up to these ideals. And the novel chronicles the often debilitating consequences of not employing a hermeneutics of suspicion towards domino dominant notions of family. In other words, they don't like consider the source. Who's telling me this business about why I'm pathological? Oh, people who hate me? OK, well, maybe I should listen. <laughs> the paradox of respectability is particularly insidious because it incites individual and interpersonal tensions that often provoke ambivalent familial relationships. So specifically in Push, this ambivalence is a complex mixture of unquestioning loyalty and wary distrust towards one fa one's family and community. So for Precious, um, she has this ardent belief in the healing properties of conservative black nationalism. And her increasing skepticism of its tenets challenges <coughs> the usefulness of her investment in respectability politics and her collusion with it. I argue that push compels us to consider respectability politics as the flawed strategy Precious and others employ that insist that they can overcome their misfortunes or bad experiences by behaving in ways that affirm repressive ideals of propriety, emphasizing heteronormativity, Western ideals of physical beauty, especially colorism, uh, jingoism, and other he hegemonic constructs. Push consistently rejects any easy solutions to Precious's challenges with family, especially count casting doubts on the use of nationalism. And rather than Precious being saved by um, sort of a traditional uh, heteronormative family, she's saved by her sister. She's saved by the young women who are um, of her same socioeconomic level who are struggling working class folk, who are struggling with literacy uh, in school, right? So she's not saved by a mother and a father. She's saved by queer <coughs> folk. She's saved by folks who are addicts. She's saved by folks who are single parents and so on. People who are like herself. Uh, and that's a community that mirrors love towards her, not some sort of like Cosby-esque family that she sort of thinks she should belong to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I'm not sure what else I want to say. I feel like I talked a lot, and I talked too quickly. Uh, but I'll just end by just citing a little bit from my epilogue, which, you know, it's maybe not a proper epilogue. I'll say that now since it's published and I can't do anything about it. But uh, I didn't know how to end it and I just wanted it to be done. So I wrote this <laughs> five page thing uh, that at least starts out in a way that it's telling the truth, right? So in August of 2012, um, I was featured in Essence Magazine with Brittany Cooper and Moya Bailey. Uh, and we were featured uh, in that August edition. Uh, because of our work with the Crunk Feminist Collective. And so excited, we got photographed, we had this like um, glam squad, and I got fake eyelashes and it was wonderful. <laughs> and so I was living in Alabama at the time and I was going to all the various um, bookstores and public supermarkets and so on, trying to find a copy of the August 2012 edition, uh, which comes out in like June, of um, <laughs> Essence, right? And they said, it's Nia Long on the cover. Nia Long's gonna be on the cover. I'm like, Nia Long, yes, okay. I'm looking everywhere, there's no Nia Long. I come to Atlanta to do something, and there's